So hello. So I, I know I'm the last uh, talk before lunch, and basically all you want to know is what is there to eat, but I'm not going to talk about it. Today I'm going to talk about something that GBAs will be really happy that developers one day know. It's how to get good performances, even if you're using an ORM and understanding what the heck is happening uh, in your database. So. Just a little bit word about me. I'm Louise Grandjean, and I work at Ulule. It's a, it's a company that is a, it's a crowdfunding company. Uh, we are in France, in Italy, in Belgium, uh, in uh, did I say Spain already? And in Canada. Uh, if you don't know what crowdfunding is, I guess that you might know Kickstarter. So we are like a French version of Kickstarter with a lot of wine and baguettes, I guess. Uh, so I mostly do Python and Django there, and uh, more and more SQL, and I love Postgres, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And uh, on, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm Louise Meta. So today we're going to talk about SQL, RMs, query plans, a lot of things. And for that, uh, we're going to start with uh, asking ourselves the question, can understanding the query plan and what is a query plan help me? Uh, the second question is really important, interesting for developers. It's what if I'm using an ORM? Does it still uh, apply to me? And so the third part and the most important part, you could almost fall asleep in the two first part, by the way, is uh, so wh what happens in my database when I query stuff? So understanding the output of a query plan. So first question, can understanding the query plan help me? And if I answered no to this question, I could leave and it would be a really short talk. So I kind of have to say yes. And first the question being, so what is a query plan? So it's you. In my talk, you're an all. And uh, if you haven't understood it, it's mostly because uh, Ulula has an all as its logo. So, yeah. Uh, so that's you and you're querying stuff and, and, and then you get a result and in there, there is like uh, this huge mystery of what's happening here. And it's a big question and it's a really interesting one. So what's happening is that uh, your SQL query here is parsed. Uh, in this parsing, it's going to generate a query tree. It's an internal data structure. And it's also going to detect all the syntax mistakes that you have made. And then there is the query planner and optimizer. And that's kind of the brain of your database and the most, well, important part. It's, uh, it's going to generate execution plans for a query. So it's going to generate multiple ways to execute your query and uh, calculate the cost of each of this plan, of each of this algorithm, if you want. And the best one is used to execute your query. So then it's going to execute and return the result. That's really simple. So why is it important to understand the query plan chosen by your, by your database? It's, it, it will help you understand why your queries are slow if they are slow. Uh, if you're going to understand how tables are joined or they are filtered and ordered. And also, maybe if you're a developer, you have once done that in your life, and I'm going to scare a few DBAs in the room. You're using your RM and you're like filtering one colon, and it's really slow. So you're like, eh, I'm going to add an index and see if it helps. So you add your index, and maybe it helps, and maybe it doesn't. So you're going to have to, you know, you're going to be able to stop doing that and really know if you're actually missing an index or maybe if there is another problem in your query. So what if you're using an ORM? I know that ORM I like the beast that DBAs hate. And um, I, I'm pretty sure that half of the working time of a DBA is complaining about it and the other half is maybe working and drinking beers, I guess. But here the question is not really should developers use or not an ORM. It's like a reality that you can't really avoid. ORMs are useful and used by developers. So yeah, you have to deal with it, sorry. So developers, why can't you trust your ORM? Well, because your, 
Okay, your RM is like going to a restaurant and you have a little bit of a doubt about the kitchen, but you would rather not look at it because you're too scared of what you're gonna see. And that's not a good solution. You have to know what your RM is cooking for you. So the problem is that it might generate queries that you would not expect it to, to be doing. And the other problem is that it might generate slow queries that you won't know about because you're not looking. So it's really important to look at your logs. And for that, oh no, first I'm gonna give an example of dirty things RM do. Yeah, so it's uh, a story that I'm gonna tell that is going to be the same example over the slides. And it's the story of a old company. And the olds have jobs and uh, they have an employer. And uh, olds deliver letters that are between two humans. So I have 10,002 olds in my old table and 10,000 humans uh, in my, each human ever has a, has a old, it's like, come on. Uh, and uh, you have four, well, over 400,000 letters. So if you're doing a loop and you're taking, that's with the Django ORM, you're filtering on your employer name, so you want all the old working at Hogwarts and you want to print that job. Usually they post mail people, but I guess they can do other things too. And here suddenly you look into your, your logs and you see that you have, well, those queries. Well, first, they're, they're basically almost all the same because a lot of, uh, of my, of my all seem to have the same job. But the problem is that you have, you, ha you have as many queries as you have alts. And that's really bad. And ORMs have, well, at least Django ORM has a solution for, for this. It's uh, using this select related that would uh, generate a join on the, on the job table. Or you can use what is called a prefetch related that generates a second uh, query for a job and then, uh, and then do the join in, in Python. This is more for many to many than for foreign keys. So I was telling you how important it is to look at your logs when you're a developer. And uh, with Django, there are solutions that are integrated in, in, in the framework. But here, I don't think that everybody's using this, uh, this framework. And also, it's really nice to have one solution that can match all the ways that, like all the languages and the way of programming, either you're working on an API or, or I don't know, and you're using either PHP or, or Python, it's all the same solutions, just simply looking into your database logs. And so to know where they are, if you don't know it already, uh, you can go in your PSQL interface and show the log directory that will return this PG log, usually. And uh, then, but it does, it's not the full path, so if you don't know where it is, you can just do show data directory, so your logs will be, in this case, in user, local, var, postgres, pg log. And inside this uh, folder, you will find files that have, that are, that have, that you can get the name from the show log file, log file name. Uh, here in this case, uh, my logs have the, have the name of uh, my PostgreSQL year, month, and day log. So, now that you know where your, your logs are, what you want uh, when you're working on, uh, on your local computer is to log everything to be sure that you're not missing on, on something. So, you have to change your, conf your config file. Where your config file is, well, Again, with a PSQL, you can just show config file and find it. And then you would have to add these little lines uh, so you can configure your log file name. Uh, you want to log everything and the minimum duration is like zero, so please give me whatever is happening in my database. So now I'm gonna talk about a tool that is, uh, it's really useful, it's called PG State Statements. PG state statement is an extension, and once you've enabled it, it will track uh, statistics on the query executed by the server. 
So to enable it, you do create the extension PG state statements. And then you have, again, to change your PostgreSQL file. You have to add it to your shared preload libraries. So it means that you really have to restart your database and that can be annoying if you have to do it on production. But know that it's not a big loss of, of performances and it doesn't take much space, mostly because you can actually configure how many statements are going to be tracked by the PG state statements. So you can activate it on production and probably you should because it will give you where your biggest queries are, the one that takes the most time. So once you've enabled it, here you can find the bad, what's, what's bad in your database. Well, not in your database, but what queries are painful. And so you would do this query, you, you select the total time, the min time, and the max time, and the mean time, uh, and you get the query also and how many times it's been called. So it's from the PG state statements uh, table. And uh, in this case, I ordered by mean time. And I, I gave you just uh, an example of what it, uh, it outputs, because if I put everything, it would be completely unreadable on this, uh, on this slide. So well, you can see that uh, my, I, my select count, everything from letters takes uh, 500 and 19 milliseconds, and I executed it once. So here we are. Um, just a little bit of a conclusion on this part, just uh, be really careful about looking into your logs and you're gonna be you're going to make a lot of DBAs happy if you, if you tell them, oh, I looked into my log and I think my problem is there. Like they are going to be the happiest people ever even if the uh, happy DBA is a weird image, I know. So now a little bit about the query plan and let's talk about explain. That's like what you've been all waiting for, I know. So what is explain? Well, explain will give you the, que the, the query plan, the execution plan chosen by the query planner, the thing I was talking about earlier. And uh, it's, uh, it also, if you use analyze, it will actually execute the query. So it will add the actual time. Otherwise, it will give you the cost uh, calculated by uh, the, the database. But with analyze, you will get the real time. Uh, you can roll back. So if you're using it on an update, it's really not a problem. You can just uh, do a begin, explain, analyze your, your query, and then roll back. So let's start with what does it look like? If you have never seen an explain in your life, it might look a bit weird and not really sexy at all. So here I'm taking, um, I, I want to retrieve all the alls working for at Ulul. And um, I have a something, like there's a, there are a lot of letters, some numbers, and I, I, execution time, yay, that's, that's pretty obviously how long it took. So let's go step by step. The first thing that you see here is the cost. The cost uh, two, has two numbers. The first one is the cost of retrieving the first row. And uh, the second one is the cost of retrieving all the rows that you asked. Uh, then there is the number of rows returned and uh, the average uh, size of the row. If you use analyze, you have actually have the timing, and so with actual time and uh, the number of loops. The loops is really important because it will give you the information of on how many times either it's a sequential scan that we're going to see later or an index scan is executed, and that can be one of the reasons the query is really slow. So now we saw in earlier that there was something called a sequential scan. Uh, what a sequential scan does is that it's going to read the entire, entire table, row by row, and filter what it needs. And so it can be really slow because it has to read everything. And 
In some, well, I'm going to explain that later, but in some cases in normal, in some other it's not. Here you can see that it removed by filter 10,001 all to retrieve only one. So it's kind of weird that it's, it's like reading the entire book when you only want to know something that is at page 10. So what you might need is an index. So let's create the index. And before we see the result after that of the explain, I would like to remind you a little bit about indexes. Um, I know that for some DBA it's like really easy peasy, but I mean, that's important. Um, what an index is, it's actually like an encyclopedia when you think of it. It's, uh, you're gonna find for a value, like if you're opening a book and you want to know everything about alls, you go to your index and you find all and you're going to find the pages where it is. The index of a database is kind of the same. It contains the value and a pointer to the row uh, it, it, there is this value in. The big difference with the normal book index is that the index that you're going to have in a database has the same number of values than in your table, except if you're using a gene index. So here, for example, I have, I don't know how many values of Hogwarts, and for each value, I have a pointer to the all matching it. So now if I do again, now that I've created my index, I do again this query, and suddenly it's using an index can, and it's way more, it's way faster. Like, it's, it's, it dropped from one milliseconds to 0 0.1, and what is happening when you're using an index is that it visits uh, the, it, it, it will go on your index, select the values uh, that are matching your wear clothes and visit each row one at a time. But here, I'm gonna give another example because it's not because you have an index that your database is necessarily going to use your index. And the example here would be uh, filtering on the really common values. Like here, most of my alls work at the post office. It's 7,000 out of 10,000. And if I do this query and uh, I ask for the alls that have the employer name post office, it's again using a sequential scan. So you might think, yeah, but why? If, if there is an index, should use the index? Yes, but no. So yeah, there's a lot of writing, so you don't have to read it. Um, I'll, I'll share the slides and I'll, I'm explaining it right now. So um, what it's doing is that uh, when it's, the fact is that you have to think that to read rows, you have a moving head in your database. And for the, the reading head, moving from one, uh, one row to another that has no like that is not related to the other one, it takes a thousand times, uh, it's a thousand times slower than just reading the next physical block. So if it's a really common value, it's easier to just read everything and filter. If that's not clear, just rethink about the whole encyclopedia thing. If you're reading an encyclopedia about birds and you want to know all the time the, the word birds is used, it's quicker to read every page than go to the index and select all the, all, all the pages and go to each page. That's, that would be really stupid, sorry. So what if, okay, we have a really common value and a really rare value and, uh, and in one case it's using an index scan and in another case it's using the, sequen the sequential scan, but there's a gray area in between them, where it's, there are common values. Like here, I have 2,000 alls out of my 10,000 alls working at Hogwarts. And suddenly, it's using what is called a bitmap hip scan. What a bitmap hip scan is, is that it's going to visit the, your index and uh, take every tuple pointer that matches your wear clothes and put them in a map. And uh, instead of visiting it as a normal index can, it's gonna be ordered in the map uh, with the physical memory order. And uh, so, yeah. 
the goal of that is to limit this, those little jumps uh, from the reading head that I was telling you are really uh, slow. So what you might think here is, okay, but in your previous slide, there was something called a recheck condition on employer name. And if it's using the index to build the map, why would it recheck? And you would be right. Also, you're really fast at reading explain. So that's a really useless superpower, but congratulations. So here, the recheck condition. What happens is for if the bitmap gets too big, what it's going to do is instead of giving each row in the, in the bitmap, it's going to give you the pages. So your database, instead of, uh, of going from row to row, will visit each row in a page. So in the, yeah, it's, it's going to read the next physical block in each page it, uh, it found and retrieve the, um, the rows that are matching your workloads. Why is it quicker? Well, because it's sure that in these pages, it will find the right, uh, the right rows. If that wasn't clear, rethink about, yeah, I'm giving a lot of encyclopedia examples. But if you're, again, reading your encyclopedia and uh, wanting to know everything about bird's beak, uh, it's common to talk about beaks, but it's not like as common as talking about birds in a bird encyclopedia. So maybe your uh, index would give you the chapters where you can find this information. And so in these chapters, you will be sure to find something and you will only, only read the chapters that are interesting to you. So here we are, we have three types of scans. We have the sequential scan, the index scan, and the bitmap hip scan. And so now we want to join tables because that's something that we do really often. So first I'm gonna join on my old table and my, my, on my job table, on, and I want uh, the job of the olds, basically. And it's using something called a nested loop. So what is happening here? For the Python developers, it might be clearer with an index. Basically, it's a loop inside a loop. So for each owl, I would uh, go and uh, do a loop of other jobs. And if it matches the, the right job, well, I join and I pass to the next one. So the complexity is from n time m, n being the size of your old table and m of your job table. So it can be really expensive. It's used for really small tables. Uh, and that's, that's not always a problem. It can be, but it's not all the time a problem. So what happens if the table is a bit bigger? Uh, it's using something called a hash join. So a hash join is like in Python doing a dictionary. Like I would retrieve the alls and uh, put my, uh, on my um, join field, I would do a dictionary and put, and then when I loop over the, the alls, I can simply use my dictionary with, the, with the, the key. So it's going to create a hash table, the hash table with the hash key pointing on the rows that are interesting, and then it's joining like this. Um, the hash table has to fit in memory, so it's really not used for big tables. And again, in Python, if you were using this, you wouldn't do a dictionary for like a million rows. That would be a bad idea. So there is a case, like, uh, sometimes the cost of creating this hash table is bigger than actually just uh, doing a nested loop. So that's why it's not always used, because you might think, oh, okay, that's much better than a nested loop. Yes, but when you have a really small table, it's still quicker to do just a nested loop. And now we come to joining on really big tables, and it's, it's using something called a merge join. So what is happening here? is that it will sort both tables and then uh, do the join. But the problem is that it has to sort. And if you don't have an index, this sorting can be costly. So 
think about it if it's you if you're you have a query using a merge join also think that maybe it's using a merge join because you're trying to retrieve too many rows that can be also a reason so we have three types of joins the nested loop the hash join and the merge join so now we are going to use the order by that is also really important so what's happening here i am selecting all my humans and ordering them by last name and uh, what I see is that it's using something called a quick sort. And it's taking, uh, what, a, a thousand and kilobytes, basically. And so what happens here is that it's going to order all your rows uh, into memory. So it can be costly. It's, it's not that it's not normal, but on big tables, it can be a real problem. So if you're using order by limit, suddenly you can see that the memory is much smaller. Suddenly it goes from 1,000 kilobytes to 25. So it's still being sorted uh, into, into memory, but why is it that much smaller? Well, because it's using this algorithm called top and hip sort. What is a top and hip sort? What it's going to do is that it's going to create a tree with a limited size. If you limit by three, your tree will have three leaves and that's it. And for each row, if the heap, if your, if your tree isn't full, it's go simply going to add to your tree the value. But if uh, the tree is full, it's going to compare your current value to all the one already in your tree. So what's happening is that if it's, if if it's a um, bigger value, it's not going to do anything in the case of an ascending sorting. And if it's uh, smaller than any of the value in your tree, it's going to pop the last and insert your row. So I did a little bit of a, of, of a drawing because I know that might not be super clear. So here I am uh, ordering my human by last name. And so for the first iteration, I just insert in my tree the, the value Potter. And then I have Bailey and Potter, and for the third iteration, Potter, uh, Acosta, Bailey, and Potter. So my tree is full. The, the fourth iteration is Weasley. Weasley is bigger than any of the value in the tree, so I don't give a damn, and I, and I just skip it. And the fifth value is uh, Carol. So Carol is, uh, is, well, smaller than Potter, so we just insert Carol and remove Potter, and everything is happy, except, you know, uh, not manage more people. So if you're using an index, if you have an index on your colon, and here I created on human last name, it's using simply the order of the index, and that's really fast, and that's great. So you have to be careful about ordering. If you're sorting, uh, yeah, if you have... If you're uh, ordering without any limit and with it, without any index, it can be really quickly costly because it's using the quick sort I was talking about. And you might need an, an explain, but you, you have to use explain to be sure of it. So now I'm going to take an example that is a bit more complex. Um, it's this one. You are called by the Ministry of Magic. Uh, you are the DBM, the D -D database magician. And they ask you for anyone that would be a bit suspicious, like people who would write a little bit too much to Voldemort or answering a bit too fast. That's weird. So they are asking you to give them a list of the letters sent by Voldemort. And uh, for each of this letter, we want the date of the reply and the user, or the human, that replied to Voldemort. So the result that they want is, well, the first name and the last name of the person, their ID in the database, the letter of Voldemort, the, the ID of the letter of Voldemort, when it was sent, and if there is an answer, the, the, the ID and the date. So here you can, they would say, okay, those people are not that suspicious, but that Jamie something, is like he answered, well, two months later, but still, that's weird. 
So if we do the Python version, what we would do is retrieve all the letters from Voldemort, all the letters to Voldemort, and then do a nested loop. And so for each of the letters from Voldemort, we would look into the letters to Voldemort, look if the user, the sender idea is uh, the same as the receiver idea, and if the date is uh, bigger, because uh, if it's, it's, yeah, it's, if it's bigger, it's probably an answer because, you know, like you don't answer to people before they read written to you. And so I did this and it takes, it, with Python it takes a thousand milliseconds. So it's on, like it's over a second and a half. So as a database magician, you would be like, oh, I want to use SQL first to have fun because writing SQL is great. And also because I'm pretty sure I can do better than one second and a half. So you would write an amazing query that is this one. And um, I am using something called a lateral join. So what's happening here is that I have a subquery uh, that is L1 that are the letters from Voldemort, ordered by Sendat. And I join, I use this join lateral, and uh, I'm, so on the letters that have uh, Voldemort as, as their receiver, and they're the sender I join on the sender ID is the L1, so my subquery, receiver ID. And also I do like this send at is bigger than the, the one before. So, I have this great query and I'm pretty proud of myself, except, well, it takes 48 seconds. So, yeah, I haven't done really better than Python at this point. I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do an explain on that. And then I end up with this result and I'm like, okay, that's depressing. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm gonna focus on the old parts so that we are going to understand better what, why it's so slow. So, here, it's using a sequential scan on letters. You can see that uh, it's filtering over 400,000 and just taking a thousand of them. What you might think is, well, can I, writing thousand of, uh, a thousand letters is still big. Voldemort writes a lot. Um, but it's, it's weird to use a sequential scan for that. And the other problem is, and I, I'm too small to point it, but, oh no, great. It's here. Uh, it's that it's uh, doing a, a thousand loop. And so your sequential scan is not that slow. It's 45 milliseconds, but times a thousand, it takes, well, 48 seconds in the end. So there's a problem with that. So maybe, looking at my query, I'm missing an index. And the columns that I would need to index would be the receiver ID, the sender ID, and the sent at. To that, I'm gonna do a little bit of a reminder on multi-column indexes. When you're using a multi-column index, well, it's going to, like you're gonna have, well, your first column here ordered, and it's gonna point to all the sent at values and the receiver ID value. What I want to point out here is that if you're focusing on the sender idea, the order is the right one in your index. So if you're using uh, select everything from letters where sender ID is this one, the index will be used. And if you're, uh, it, the same is true if you're filtering on sender ID and sent at, filtering or ordering. It's really important to ask yourself this question because if you want to, if you have a lot of queries in your, in your application, using the receiver ID, the receiver ID column in your index is not in the right order. So it's not going to be used. So you have, in this, in this example, this, uh, this index is the right one, but you still have to question yourself about what's uh, happening in the rest of my application. You can't just add uh, indexes whenever and where, like for every query that you find a little bit slow. You have to ask yourself what indexes would be necessary for other queries of your application. But here I'm, I'm creating this, uh, this index. And suddenly it takes, instead of my 48 seconds, it only takes seven milliseconds. 
here. That's amazing. Yay, it's, it's 180 times faster than Python. So yeah, we are pretty happy about it. It's still doing this thousand loops, but instead of 50 milliseconds each time, it only to, takes uh, what 0 0.003 milliseconds. So even if you times it a thousand, it's still quick. Um, I'm going to go a step further because here we are really happy. It's seven milliseconds instead of one second. But because you are really uh, like a developer that really wants to do his job so good, you want it to go even further in uh, optimizing your query. So what you can see here is that it's using a hash join to join on the human table. And the human table uses a sequential scan. So you are actually retrieving maybe a, a too many humans so that it would use the, the index on, the, on your human ID table. And it's doing a hash table on your uh, subquery. So what if we use a pagination? I'm using a pagination by, by key and not with an offset. So I'm retrieving the first, uh, like the first page that I would want with a sent at that would be bigger than uh, 2010. I know that technically Voldemort was dead at this time, but I was like, uh, okay, that's okay. Um, and so if we use a uh, pagination, suddenly it's using an index scan on, on human and a nested loop. Here it's using a nested loop because I've paginated by 20. And so, and so doing a nested loop on a table on a, well, a result that has 20 rows and with an index on the other side is the quickest way. So suddenly I have a query that takes 0 0.4 milliseconds. So your conclusion is that with Python, you had 1,000 milliseconds and now you're just 0 0.4 and you're super happy. So conclusion. The conclusion is that as a developer, you really have to look into your logs. That's really important. Uh, use PG state statements. If you don't really know where your biggest queries are, it's a really nice uh, extension. And using uh, explain will really give you a lot of information on what's happening in your query. But, and maybe your query has no problem, but you will be just happy to know it. So that's it. I don't know if any of you have questions. Is there any question? Um, hello, thank you very much, especially for your examples that are very good with the encyclopedia. Uh, I was wondering, you told us that if we add a limit uh, with the end top heap search, it's much faster. What happens if I had an offset? Because I cannot say, okay, I can keep the three better, better answers because I have to know that the three better are so oh, off the offset. Okay, what so what then? you need is a pagination more than the, like, you, you need the pagination, right? Uh, the problem of the offset is that uh, instead of taking just the rows that you need, it's, if, you, if you want the last page, it's going to um, sort all the, all the rows and take the last one. So it's still really heavy in terms of memory. So... It's better to, if, you're, if you need a pagination, you use, should use a pagination by, by key. So use your ID, or in my example, I was using the sent at. Uh, and if I wanted the second page, I could uh, change my sent at uh, value. So offset is uh, kind of something that we don't really love with PostgreSQL. You should try to avoid it. I know that most of ORMs use offset to paginate, but... Thank you. <clears throat>